All right, so there are a couple things I'm going to do differently, so I'm hoping it all works out. Um, but bear with me here. This will be fun. Um, my name is Matt Conda. I'm going to talk about insecure expectations. Um, I put this up here just to kind of give you a little background. I come at security from a developer point of view. I wrote code for 15 years before I even really started thinking about security. Um, I worked for a security company um, where I worked on scanners and um, pen test manager tools and a variety of different things related to security. Uh, someone made the bad decision to take me to Black Hat and DEF CON, and I kind of got sold down that road, and I got really into it. Um, and then a whole bunch of people who, who worked at Spider Labs broke into my applications. And I was all kind of shocked and, you know, wow, I don't know very much about security. How do I learn about it? What's going on? And I, I found out about, about OWASP, and I also found out that a lot of developers don't know about security. So a lot of what I like to talk about and work on is figuring out how to get developers engaged with security. Um, the main highlights I'd point out here, um, some interesting things I got to do were run pretty big development projects with Agile. So a lot of people in security don't like Agile. I could talk to you about that. I love it. Um, I think it's actually good for security. Um, I've also done a bunch of Builder Breakers talks with like John Rose and John Claudius and a bunch of other folks. And um, that's a, a talk where we kind of try to um, pit the builder against the breaker and point out how the people aren't communicating maybe. And that's a little bit about what this talk is about. I always put this slide up just because I named my company something nobody can ever remember <laughs> and, or say, so I thought I'd just put that in. Um, when I decided to start my own company, that's, some of you may have done that. It's a big decision and you need the support of a lot of people, and so I like to call them out. Um, so but those are my two daughters and my wife. Um, and I guess I want to start, I, I kind of hate presentations where you wait 45 minutes for the five minute demo, so I want to start with just something to show you what I'm talking about. Don't worry about getting everything out of it, but this is going to illustrate what we're talking about. So this is a, a browser that's being driven by WebDriver. Um, in the background, you would have seen a shell where I ran a cucumber command. We'll talk about what that is. What's happening is I'm filling out the form here, um, and I'm going to submit it. And I'm just using a simple WebDriver script to make this all happen. And I don't write good code, so it's slow. I'm just kidding. Um, and then I'm going to update the project, and I'm going to set the name to something malicious. Right? When I save it, nothing happens because that's not where the bad code execution path is. But when I delete it, it's going to run the command that's in, embedded in the name of that project, right? So this is a system basically where I have projects. I create projects. I manage projects. That's the idea. And when I destroy a project in Rails, this is the destroy method that's going to get called in my controller, um, I'm basically assuming that I have a log file that sits with my project, and I'm just calling a system command, right? And what I'm doing that's really bad here, which you may or may not know based on the syntax, is I'm including the name of the project without ever worrying about what it could be, right? So it's just a simple case of sanitization, right? Um, what's kind of cool about that is, so if I set the project name to this, what you should have seen at the very end was the password file sitting in the browser, right? That's a good way to get developers' attention. Um, usually they think that's really bad. Um, I gave a version of this talk at Windy City Rails, which is a techn technical Ruby on Rails conference. Um, and I asked people, like, how many people write tests? How many people use test-driven development? And how many people use business or behavior-driven development? Sorry. And we'll talk about what those are in a minute. But almost everybody wrote tests in the Rails community. Um, they're pretty good about that. I think that's partly because if you don't write tests in Ruby, you don't know if your code works. You don't even know if it's, it's, it's not getting compiled, so you don't even know if it's going to run. Um, Test-driven development was much lower. Behavior-driven development was almost none, um, but there were some. And what I'm doing is going to talk about really behavior-driven development, kind of taking the testing to, a, to that level. When I asked how many people knew about OWASP, and there were about 400 people in the room, it was definitely less than 50, probably less than 20 that knew what OWASP was. So maybe I should say that again. 
there were 400 people in the room and less than 50 knew what OWASP was, right? So this is kind of the issue that I think is probably the one takeaway from this talk. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be others, but that's the one takeaway from this talk. Um, I asked them how many write security tests, so how many people write tests to, to look at security conditions in their code, and about two raised their hand out of 400, right? So people aren't writing tests for security. And so really the goal of this whole project was to explore how we could do that, how, could, how we could get developers to write tests for security. Now, I'm not necessarily advocating that we write comprehensive tests for security as part of our projects because that's potentially time consuming to the point of being, you know, diminishing return. Um, but I think it's an interesting angle and I think developers can learn a lot from at least example tests um, and used in the right place. So what I want to do is talk about the technology we use to do that example here. RSpec is what most um, what, what a lot of Rails developers use to write their tests now. Um, and typically they use it to prevent things like this, which are just like business logic flaws, right? I don't know if you saw this, but this is where a minus one turned into a, whatever it is, 64 trillion, right? It just kind of rolled over because it was signed or unsigned or whatever. Um, that's something that you could pretty easily detect with an RSpec test. Mm -hmm. And this is what an RSpec test could look like for a real Rails application, right? So here I've defined a user model, and I'm describing the user model in my test, and I'm basically writing a test that proves that validation that's embedded in my user model is sufficient. So I'm testing that I shouldn't allow passwords without a, a number. I'm testing that I shouldn't allow short passwords. I'm testing that I shouldn't allow passwords without an alphanumeric character, right? So that's what this test, this RSpec is doing, right? Um, it's very simple runs in about 10 seconds. It's kind of the simplest example I can think of of how to write RSpec to test your, some security conditions in your code, right? And what developers want to see is a green light, right? You run your test, you get the green light, great. When we add Cucumber, what we're doing is advancing the state of how we talk about testing, right? We're building on top of RSpec. Cucumber defines these terms, which we'll talk about in some detail here, feature, scenario, and then a given when then kind of explanation of what's happening. And a feature, this is like English language for like people, not developers or security people, but like theoretically the, the vision for behavior driven development is that business owners or product managers can write test cases. I don't think that's actually how it's used, um, but it presents some interesting um, it gives us some interesting things when we apply it to security because if I approach a product manager and say, hey, you have insecure direct object reference, they're kind of like, I don't really know what that is or care. Can you explain it? Um, but if I say, I want to ensure that person B is restricted from seeing something that's person A's data, they understand that, right? And they actually assume you already did it, right? We never communicated about whether we were doing that or not. So in Cucumber terms, a scenario would be maybe a person's trying to access data that's not theirs. So we have, now we can define the scenario using this given when then. It's pretty straightforward, right? Given a user that's logged in who created a new project, when a different user logs in and tries to access the project, then the system shouldn't let them, right? So here's a demo where I'm running my test for that. The first user is going to create a new project. It's fairly straightforward. Um, the second user is going to log in and basically access that project. And depending on whether he, can, he or she can see the project, they're going to pass or fail the test, right? So here's the second user signing up. And this is going to fly by, but they're navigating to project slash 52, which is the, use, the first user's project, right? And when they do that, the tests fail. Right, that's what the console looks like. So what we can do is make this all sort of automatic, right? And the developer can understand Cucumber and RSpec to be able to understand what we're talking about. Here's what the act that actually looks like, right? And what, what Cucumber is defining with these features are, is basically a DSL, a domain-specific language, on the fly. So you're saying, oh, if I see a new project created by a user, then this is the stuff I need to do, okay? I'm going to... Basically, I create a new UUID so that I get unique usernames every time I run the test, um, which is just handy. And then I have helper functions like register as user 
that's shared across the tests. Same for new project. Pretty obvious what I'm doing here. I'm basically creating a user, creating a project, and then grabbing the URL for the project once it's navigated there. This is the code that's actually driving the browser, right? So as I show you the demo of the browser going, getting filled in and doing this, this is the code that's driving that, right? And so then I say when a different user or a different person tr attempts to access the project, so in order to implement that, I create a second user and I navigate to the URL. It's very simple, right? And then, or I visit the URL in the then part, sorry. When I expect the page not to have the content that I put in, in the first, for the first user, right? It's a very simple test, um, but either you're going to have it or you're not, and if you have it, that means you're seeing something you shouldn't be able to see. At, again, at this Windy City Rails conference, part of what I was trying to do was help the people who were working in Rails understand this. So I've, I have this application called Triage, which is open source on GitHub. It's pretty meaningless. Like, I wouldn't download it to think you're going to get anything, but it's useful as a foil for the tests, right? And it's useful as a kind of a, the opposite side of the, um, the educational side of the testing framework. So this is, you know, for example, I put SQL injection in here, right? So this is a Rails method where I'm showing an index, and I'm not, I'm not using any kind of escaping for the parameter that's passed in, so I can do SQL injection. This is handy because a lot of times I've found that developers respond well to examples that show what the problem is, right? As opposed to um, examples that um, are talking about it from a pure security perspective and don't explain the problem. So what I did with the, the SWTF, which is also open, and I put it on Bitbucket instead of GitHub to kind of share the wealth, um, and I also like that it abbreviates to security WTF, <laughs> um, is basically um, implement these security tests in a way that people could copy and then use. And I'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, if you wanted to use it, you could basically pull it down, um, point at your host, whatever you want to run against, and start defining your drivers. So in that, in that test case we were looking at before, where I said register as user, this is what it was doing. And then this visit, fill in, fill in, fill in, click button, that's all a web driver basically to tell it what to do. And so once I define these register as user, log out, log in as user, you know, define a new project helpers, then I can use them wherever I want in my code and it's, it makes it very easy to write quick scenarios. Any questions about that? Does that make sense, kind of how that fits together? Okay. Um, so this is what this actually looks like in Cucumber. We define a feature, and then we define, um, this is another example where we're talking about some cross-site scripting, right? So I'm going to define a scenario outline, and this is building on some dynamic capability within uh, Cucumber. So I can say, given a field name, which is dynamic, and a value, which is dynamic, I expect a result, which is dynamic, right? So instead of a sort of static, given when, then, this is what's going to happen, I can define a table, essentially, and sorry, this wrap, um, where the field name is my project name, project name, project description, and I'm going to put in these values, and I'm expecting it to either show me that there's cross-site scripting or not, depending on what the input is and what the field is, okay? Um, the code behind this is basically creating a new project, putting in um, the, feed, the values that were defined in that scenario into the form fields, um, and then handling the pop-up depending on what the expectations were. Turned out that was one of the trickier things about writing this test, was figuring out how to know when to handle a pop-up and when not to. Because it's not an error if there's no pop-up, but sometimes you might expect one. So it just gets a little tricky. Um, so that's the other thing, actually, that people get, get out of this is, I'll just let the demo run, um, is example tests that show you how to do certain things that I thought were tricky the first time, right? Some of them were easy, but some of them were a little tricky. Like that catching the pop-up was a little tricky. Um, we'll talk about some looking at session and cookies and stuff like that in a minute. And you have to actually pop out of WebDriver to do that. So I hope those examples are useful. The folks at Windy City Rails seem to think this was kind of cool because they're like, oh, I can see how cross-site's working in the page now. I didn't really get that. Um, unfortunately, it was a short time slot, so I didn't have time to explain, like, this really matters. I found that developers are very receptive if you show them beef and turn on their webcam. Um, but 
So unfortunately, this demo runs through both the scenarios where you have it and you don't, so it gets kind of boring. But there's a pop-up that happens later. Go ahead. So I'll get to that in a minute, actually, because um, the, the way I did this is a little bit different from how Ruby developers usually do it. So can I get to that in a minute? No. Let me, maybe if I explain in a second, it'll, it'll make sense here. Maybe not, I don't know. I mean, so WebDriver is just interacting with your web app, so it doesn't care. As long as the other thing is talking HTTP, basically, you can use it. Um, it's handy to, people usually use it within a Ruby app, but you don't need to. Um, I don't know if you guys need to see this. That's kind of like getting detailed. So here's, this is the answer to your question right here. So typically people write this sort of embedded in their Rails application, right? They write their tests. That's part of the application. Um, what I did is take the, and it's not like mind-boggling or anything. I just took the, the tests out. Um, so the SW2F project runs by itself. It's independent of Rails. You need a few gems, but it's pretty simple. And it allows you to basically point it at whatever you want, right? As long as you're talking to forms and posting and the things that a browser can do, it can test it. Now, it can it, it's not, I mean, it's not a, let me just say this, it's not a app scanner, it's not a, I mean, it's not a fancy tool. It's an educational tool. It's an interesting illustration. I think it's pointing in a direction. I don't think it's an, a final answer. Well, that's really the whole point, is your developers are already, already know when interesting things happen in the app. They know where there's interesting business logic. They know when they're submitting forms that are, you know, step one, two, three, four, and submit, right? They already know that. So if they can just write a couple of tests for the edge cases on that, you're in good shape, right? Um, it does mean you'd have to change the driver to change the login steps to go to your URL and fill in your form with the right fields and stuff like that. Does that make sense? You'd basically have to adjust your driver and then write your tests. But I don't know how you'd avoid that. Um, this is an example where, and this is a, now that I'm looking at it, it's kind of a terrible demo because it's driving the, the browser, but everything it's looking at you can't see because it's looking at the headers that get set. So right, we want to see that we're setting X frame options and XSS protection, and you might use this to check for a CSP policy, right? So, so you can do all that very easily in a test, and developers sometimes, you know, don't know that those things are being set or not, um, or are setting them but not effectively, like it's not actually happening, even though it seems to be from a config perspective. And most developers are not using a web proxy, so they're not looking at anything other than did the form submit or not, right? That stuff that's out of band doesn't, um, doesn't show up. I don't know if you can see this, but here I'm checking for X-frame options and XSS protection. So you could use this as an example of how to write a test to check for those headers. Does that make sense? And so here's how that scenario looks, right? And I could easily just add, the nice thing is I could just add new lines. If I have a new header, I just add the header and the value, and it'll start testing for it, right? So it's pretty easy to write once you have it started. Um, the thing that's tricky here is I have to drop out of, I just throw this up here because I thought you might be interested. Um, I have to drop out of WebDriver and use um, the net HTTP library, which is a Ruby thing directly, to be able to get at, um, to be able to, to um, what is it about this? It's, uh, yeah, getting at the headers, sorry. Right, so now I'm looking at the headers down here. I don't get the headers when I'm using WebDriver. It's really just showing you what's in the browser. You can't ask WebDriver or Selenium. Or you can use, ask Selenium, but you can't ask WebDriver for what your headers are. But in order to do that, I need to get my, my CSRF token and my session token and put them in the request so that that all works. Does that make sense? Um, so the whole point is to take a vulnerable project, which I'm calling triage, right, and run these tests to illustrate security issues, right? From an educational perspective, I figure if a developer who's working in Rails wants to run, literally they just have to get the app, bundle install Rails S, and it's going to be running triage, 
and they want to run the SWTF, it's similar. It's like, you know, you git clone it, you bundle install, and you run Cucumber, and it's going to show you this, right? And so you can start interacting with it. Um, and again, it's not comprehensive tests, but it's intended to show here's how you could write security tests for your application in languages that people understand. And this gets to your point before about it's the developers actually already know what the flow is in with you, within your application. Your ap application scanners are great tools, but they're not, they don't know how your application works. So, yeah. Has anybody heard of exploratory testing? So there's a, a woman named Elizabeth Hendrickson who works for Pivotal who wrote a book called Explore It, I think, um, about exploratory testing. It's basically trying to take QA testing and make it better. It's sort of based on the premise of you're looking at a form, like let's figure out what more we can do to, to break the form. What would, you know, it's sort of taking QA another level, I think, is kind of a, a way to think about it, um, oversimplified. And so in talking with her, I think security in a lot of ways fits well with that. I'm not suggesting every organization can have security done through their QA group, but if we just use tools, I think we're missing a whole audience. So I did this at the, at the Windy City Rails, too. Um, this is where I'm describing in English a feature. I'd like for someone to tell me what this is from a security perspective. Like, it's a two-word, well-known security class of security vulnerability. Field tampering is, could be. In Rails, everybody calls it, somebody, mass assignment, maybe. Right? So in Rails, this is mass assignment. If you tell a product manager, like, don't do mass assignment, they're like, well, what do you even mean? Like, why would you let people do that? But if you tell the developer you can't let them set fields that aren't in the form, they'll say, okay, I get it. We'll find some way to do that. Right? It might not be strong parameters or something like that, but it'll be something. Oops. You want to tell me what this one is? Yeah. Right? So it, if you say, oh, I want to make sure I don't have CSRF, that's one thing. But if you say, well, I really don't want you to be able to submit my form when I go to your page, it's obvious, right? It's sort of, to a business person, that's going to be, like, assumed. But as a developer, I don't think about it that way. And if you come at me with CSRF, I'm kind of like, you guys have all your complicated security stuff, and it's all over my head, so I'll just do the best I can, honestly, right? So that's why I think it's important to start thinking about how we can frame security issues as in language that's not so security specific. Um, and this is kind of beating that same drum, right? Like, I've worked for a bunch of consulting companies. I've never once had a client say, this is the level of security your deliverable has to be at as a developer, right? It's almost never baked in. And only recently, I'm seeing now in the last couple of years, people who are telling us up front they're going to do pen testing at the end of the engagement. Um, I actually have one engagement that's kind of my ideal, it's awesome, they actually asked me to come in for the Agile inception and help them figure out security requirements, do code review every week, do some testing at the end, do some operational documentation, like this is how it should actually work when you roll it out. Um, but that's rare. I, mean, you don't, I don't see a lot of projects like that. But the point is, if you frame it correctly, if you ask them in English in terms like this behavior-driven development is kind of going to encourage you to, they probably do care about this stuff, and they probably will make them requirements. The scope of what, what I've demonstrated in SWTF so far are these, basically injection, cross-site scripting, mass assignment, cross CSRF, secure headers, and some stuff in the session cookie. I'll show you the demo of the session cookie in a second. And again, this was really targeted toward this Windy City Rails audience where I wanted to say, hey, you know, this is all stuff you kind of should know as developers, but you probably don't. Um, so here's a, here's a quick Cucumber demo where we're going to go, and again, it's a, in a way, it's a poor demo because you can't see the cookie in the browser, right? But I'm just browsing to the site, and then in the code, I'm going to crack open the cookie, decode it, and look for sensitive data in the cookie, right? So you can write tests to do that.
yada yada yada. And I'm guessing there are not, there are probably a few people who will get this joke. <laughs> I'm going to show my age here. Um, one of the things I like to do in training with, with dev teams is do like capture the flag games. So they're like mini games, right? It's not hard games. It's like, oh, here's an app, go get. There's something in this table I want you to go get, or there's something on the file system I want you to go get. Because they have to think about what that means. Um, and you probably can't see this, but here I've got my CTF flag is 2112, my favorite album. Anybody else even recognize that, or are you all too young? Thrush. OK. Um, that's what this, this is what the test looks like, right? I mean, obviously, your app is not going to have a cookie with CTF flag in it, but you could pretty easily just print out what the cookie does have in it as a starting point, and then start to think about, oh, do I have user IDs? Do I have, what, what's in it? What can I change? I mean, how often do you see an app that has the user ID in it? You change it, and it still works as the other user. I've seen that. I'm sure you have, too. This is basically explaining how these different steps work. I think, on some level, I think you all get this already because you're coming at it from the security perspective. For the developers, that was what you know it was supposed to explain. Like, here's what the test is kind of doing in English. Um, so I looked at the OWASP top ten and I tried to you know figure out like where we had tests that would kind of illustrate different issues. Um, some of them are, are shown here. The yellow ones, I think you could do. This one. The components one, I'm not sure you can do in a, in a remote test unless you kind of have some way of enumerating what's actually running on the back end. Um, but you could write a test that looked at your dependencies and verified them against the library or something like that. But it'd be a different kind of a test. It's not going to be a web-driven test, right? You know, a natural thing would be to have it, and it doesn't do this now, but a natural thing would be say, oh, I want to go at this form and just find the fields and try the various types of attacks on it, right? It starts to become more like a scanner than a testing framework at that point. Um, and that's not really the goal. The goal is to get developers to write tests. There are lots of people who have better scanners than this. Um, one of the things that was interesting is, um, I mean, it's so funny, trying to talk to developers about you know, you want to do all these different things, and they're not even really thinking about one of them, right? Like, oh, should you do, use a web application firewall? Should you use database encryption? Should you use, you know, a, should you have a pen test? Should you do code review? I mean, the answer is kind of like yes, and they don't, it's hard to understand what to do. But the goal here was to, to find a way to get information to developers that they could digest, right? So I don't know if you think this is interesting or not, but I hope they did. <laughs> Um, I thought it was interesting for exploring, like, how do we communicate about security with, with stakeholders, right? Instead of talking about the OWASP top 10 or, or CSRF or, or insecure direct object reference, right? Let's talk about, let's talk in terms that people who aren't in security can understand. Um, and that's, I like the fact that Cucumber lets you frame it that way. And the, I mean, the third goal was to present like a working example that would get somebody part way toward being able to write their own tests. Boring. I, oh, I already told you what I, that I asked them this. They asked them how many people had pen tests, and you know, it was very few. Um, but one of the things that came up after we talked about that was, well, what if instead of giving somebody a PDF that's 50 pages long or, or a spreadsheet or a, or a report in an application that's hundreds of pages long, you know, with enumerated findings. What if I gave them a set of tests that failed? And they would know they fixed the problem when they passed. It's kind of a cool idea. Um, I think it's pretty hard to do, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and I've not had, I've had one opportunity and I haven't done it, so I feel bad. But I, I would like to try this with a client and just see what they think, right? Right. That's awesome, yeah. Well, I like the idea that they can just put it in their regular thing and get the green light. Right, that's true.
Right. 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 That's a great point. And a lot of the, if you look at the code for the, the SWTF, it validates exactly what you're saying. A lot of what I'm checking for are like, oh, is the name of the project visible on the next screen, right? Well, there could be scenarios where it's not predictably, but that didn't mean they fixed it, <laughs> right? So you're exactly right. The thing I like about having it run through WebDriver is, I mean, you get visual feedback. I mean, obviously for some of them it didn't, but for, for, for some of them it does. And, you know, for a developer it's like, oh, it popped something up or it showed me, a, you know, Etsy password. That's cool, <laughs> right? And it's a way to kind of get them engaged, and that was really what, what that was about. Well, and the problem is what developers do a lot of times when you give them screenshots, and I'm not trying to make light of what you're saying at all, but I can't tell you how many times it's like, I have 300 problems, and the top three are the things I'm dealing with, and I don't even know how to prioritize which are the most important three. So you guys put in all this work to deliver important findings, right? And the developers, A, don't have time, and B, don't understand how to fix them. And, I, and I'm on the developer side. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying it's hard. Well, yeah. Some places that works, yeah. <laughs> um, if you read the abstract for this talk, this is where I kind of am going to break off the, the technical part of it a little bit and talk about what it's been like trying to figure out how to communicate with developers and, and reach out to developers. Um, I guess I'd like to start with the good. I mean, almost every engagement I do, I'm talking about OWASP with my clients, right? Your, your report is going to reference the OWASP top 10 or whatever. If the OWASP has resources about it, it's going to be one of the references for them. Um, I don't know that I think there's a better place to go to get general information. SANS is interesting, but I don't know that it's as, as tight, to be honest, right? Like, if you're trying to point developers at something, I think OWASP is the best thing we have going. As a developer, that's what I think. Um, however, I also feel like almost every meeting I go to that's either here or, you know, I go to the Chicago OWASP group um, or anything else, I mean, it's not, developers aren't really engaged enough. Um, actually, I'm curious, how many people in the room would say that they are developers first? And every time I've asked this, people say they're both. But you have to pick one. If you had to pick one, your developer or security. Okay, a couple. That's cool. Um, that's more than usual, actually. A lot of times, in the in the, especially in the local meetings, it's 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 kind of an echo chamber. It's a lot of security people learning about some cool new exploit, which is great. Um, but it's not necessarily applicable to um, to developers. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we communicate. Um, I think Jim's work with the cheat sheets is really good. Um, I did one for the for Rails security, which is largely based on existing resources, but um, and I got a lot of help from a lot of people. Um, but I think that's digestible to developers in general. Something short. I know that I don't mean to demean it, but it's like. Um, there are, there, there's a guy, if you find me after, I can find it. I don't remember exactly where it is. There's a guy who's been working on that. And there are some really good code review guides for pure Ruby, um, which I think are referenced off of the bottom of the Rails cheat sheet. Okay. Um, so if you go check that out, see at the bottom, there's a bunch of pure Ruby stuff. Um, and I can point you to them if they're not, not there, but... Um, there are resources. I don't know that the Sinatra stuff is as, as well developed, just because I don't think it's as widely used. So another question, how many people in this room have attended a developer-focused conference this year? Two. Can you tell me what they were? Okay. Say it again. Okay. So, um, 
I guess I'm, one of the things that I think is interesting is thinking about how we can cross-pollinate, right? Have more security people go to developer conferences, have more developers go to security conferences. Um, I've submitted talks to a bunch of developer conferences, and I can tell you that if you submit an OWASP top 10 talk to a developer conference, it's not going to get accepted. Um, and I kind of can't blame them, to be honest. Um, so the question then becomes, well, what do you, what do you talk about? Right? How do you Trojan horse yourself in to talk about security at developer conference? Right? Um, and basically, this was my way of doing that for this Rails conference, was to try to come up with something that could be relevant. Does that make sense? Um, I know, you know Jim Manico does tr security training at Java 1, right? That was pretty cool. I like to see that kind of thing. Um, so this is, uh, this is going to be fun. I, want, I wonder if I can get you guys to do this. So, this is, a, this is what Windy City Rails is like. People are real friendly, and they do this thing where everybody stands up, and they virtually give each other a hug. You guys look nervous. So what I was hoping I could get you to do, what's that? This is New York. Okay, so so okay, let's do this because I actually I, I made a I made a pact with some of the Rails guys that I would try to get you guys to do this that I'd ask you to stand up, just not each not actually touch each other, <laughs> just give each other just put your arms out like this, you can do it come on, and I'm gonna take a picture and I'm gonna send it to the Rails people and show them that security cares about Rails. <laughs> oh, I think that's how they feel right now. <laughs> So stay there for a second. Hold it. This is awesome. <laughs> it's what? Oh, you got a couple people not standing up, but you know, I guess it is New York, so. All right. Thank you. That was fun. I was real nervous about whether you were going to do that or not, so. But that's what, that's, what, that's what security needs to do. It's you need to be a little more fluffy, teddy bear, you know. Um, here's an interesting question. How many people here commit to development projects, like open source? What, what are they? Yeah. Uh-huh. Node. Cool. Anyone else? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Yeah. Nice, nice. So I've done some of my own stuff. I just signed up to be a committer to Spring Security. I think it's interesting to think about, like, oh, where can we insert ourselves strategically to help people who are already doing a good job do a better job with security, right? Um, I don't mean this in any kind of political sense, um, but I think sales and community organizing are kind of like what we're doing with OWASP, really. Um, if you think about it, um, if you want to find developers, we should be finding the right developers who are going to spread the word within development communities, right? So just to tell you a little bit about what I've done, plant some seeds, maybe you guys will have better ideas. Um, so I started by going to a Chicago Ruby meetup. Chicago has a 100-person meetup every month. And I just said, hey, I'll go and talk about OWASP and security and stuff. And I did it with John Claudius, who's a, a super awesome dude. And... Um, and they were like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> um, can you come back to a hack night? And they have a, an alternate meeting where they have 40 or 50 or 60 people come. And you're basically sitting at your laptop working hands-on. You're not, it's not a presentation. You're just working. And what they did is we ran Breakman on a bunch of people's projects. And we said, what do we find? What can we learn from what we find? Is it bad to eval a string you get in as an, a parameter in a HTTP form, right? Yes, it's bad to eval... <laughs> Right, And so that was interesting because people got to see their breakman results in their code. Right? Um, so those were both really rewarding, fun, um, small-scale things that I did. And then they kind of, I think, were leaping off into getting into Windy City Rails and going to you know, what was a, a still a small but a bigger developer conference. Right? Um, I got to know a lot of the people in that community. I write Rails apps, too, so it was a win-win. Um, thinking about contributing to OS, open source we talked about just now. 
I think the other thing that we don't do enough of, and I don't mean to be critical, but I don't know that we listen to developers all that well about what they need. I mean, have, how many people have asked the developer, what do you need to do a better job with security? Woo! <laughs> Go ahead. Or are you just saying you did it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing I did is I said, oh, well, who, who are some thought leaders I can go after? So I went after Martin Fowler and Neil Ford. I picked some people who were well-known and said, you guys need to start talking about security. It doesn't need to be your focus, but you need to say something about it, right? ThoughtWorks does this technology radar. There's nothing about security in it at all, right? I don't understand why there's nothing about security. I asked them. They said, well, what would you put? What would you guys put in a, thought, in a ThoughtWorks technology radar about security? <laughs> I mean, that's how I started off. Like, oh, of course, it's important, but what do you actually say? Right? I mean, that is all, the, 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 if you've never read it, it's a great thing to read anyway. It's all about, we see Node.js doing this. We see, you know, it's about trends with app servers and UI frameworks and technology radar. It's, it's aimed at application developers to sort of talk about what ThoughtWorks sees as the, as the direction. It's a great, it's a great read, right? Um, but it doesn't mention security, and when I asked them, they really said, well, what would you say? I still think that's valid. I don't know what I, don't know what I would say. Go to OWASP. That's what I kind of said at first, was like, tell people to go look at OWASP.org. Look at the top ten. But that's kind of meaningless. Do I tell them to go do a WAF? I mean, I don't want ThoughtWorks telling developers to use a WAF. Or a static analysis, or any tool, substitute your vendor here. I don't want that to be the message. Right? So, what is the message? I don't know the answer to that. Um, what's that? Right? Well, that is, the, that is the message, but how do you. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing is, okay, another thing is to make developer friends. Not like this. Like that. <laughs> Not like this. <laughs> like that. We, we perceive you like that. Let me just tell you that. <laughs> um, one of the things I did in the Chicago chapter of OWASP was to try to find, I sent a, list, a message to the whole list and said, hey, who's interested in trying to figure out how to solve these problems? And I got 15 people who sort of self-volunteered and said, I'm interested in these problems. I want to figure out how to do better. And we basically haven't done anything yet. <laughs> but a couple of those people knew Neil Ford really well. A couple of those people had other, you know, angles of looking at things. We want to make it part of our month, our, we want to have monthly meetings, but we also want to make it part of our periodic meeting that we're talking about developer outreach and not just the latest security cool stuff. I mean, the latest security cool stuff is awesome, don't get me wrong. Um, I also think it's, it's important to decriminalize, and I just put that in quotes because it's not really criminalized, but a lot of developers are going to be very self-conscious when you tell them that they don't know anything about security. And even though it may be true, I was one of them. I still am one of them on certain things. I'm sure there are lots of things you guys know that I don't know. I think it's really important to invite them to the table and have the conversation. Otherwise, you're not solving the problem. Does that make sense? I'd like to see developers invited specifically to speak at OWASP meetings. If we have to give them topics and sort of seed that, great. I don't know how many of the speakers at this conference are, you know, would self-characterize as developers. Um, finding things that developers can do at meetings. Maybe you have hacked sessions. A lot of you guys probably write tools, um, right? Get a developer to partner with. I've seen security people code. It's not always good, <laughs> honestly. Ask for help, right? Get a developer partner on your, on your open source project. Um, Find a place on the OWASP site to, to invite developers to contribute more. Get developer on the OWASP board. Right? These are all things that I think are interesting, maybe or maybe not provocative. I'd love to see more of what you guys think. I think I'm running out of time, so I'll wrap. Um, these are a bunch of people I wanted to thank. You don't need to read that, but you can if you want. Um, Again, I'm a developer, so I had people take me to Black Hat and DEF CON. That was how I got introduced. It was awesome. I was blown away. Um, it's mostly John Rose. He took me and uh, 
It's like, yeah, just hang out with Fyodor or, or whoever you want. It's cool. And I was like, holy sh... You know, but it was awesome. It was, it, was, it, was, it was great. And a lot of these people have helped me with Rails-specific stuff. I just like to mention them because they help a lot. Um, I'm just looking for your... I don't see the, the, the non-Rails one on there, but I think if you, I think if you go to the um, Rails cheat sheet, it's listed at the bottom there. And I'll be sharing this somewhere, probably on speaker deck. I think it depends on how it's set up. Like you can, a lot of times you can just see by looking at um, headers, but not always. It depends. People turn that off. They should turn that off. <laughs> um, Nginx, yeah. Yeah. Before I stop, I do want to just thank all the people in the yellow shirts and the, the OWASP New York and New Jersey chapters for hosting this event. It's been awesome. I really have had fun. So thanks. And thank you for being here.